Hello, it's time again for a Vera Med lecture. Today we're going to talk about obesity and some of the molecular aspects of it associated with endocrinology and epigenetics. So I've um, warned that I was going to do this lecture for some time and I put it together, composed it, and I hope that it's going to be a coherent discussion where we're going to try to dig pretty deep into uh, a couple of molecular pathways. So if you've seen previous lectures from this Veramed series, uh, it would be beneficial to you, but I don't think you need to because I will try to explain things as I go along. So what time is it? It is time to get started. But we can ask, of course, does anybody really know what time it is? Um, well, probably if we think about time being something that's sequential and based just on how our mind operates in terms of the world around us, we ourselves know what time it is. But whatever time it is, it's not time for quitting time yet. So it's not uh, that time. It is time for Vera of Met. So let's get started. Slideshow on. All right. So let's go. So again, and at the um, global topic level, I'm going to call this the epigenetics of obesity. There's going to be a lot of other things we can talk about in subsequent lectures. So the subheading and the real discussion here uh, today is the endocrine metabolic regulation via the central nervous system, AMP kinase, that's adenosyl monophosphate kinase, mediated lipid clearance and glucose homeostasis. Now, I know that's quite a mouthful. Of course, lipids and carbohydrate are quite a mouthful, right? Uh, hook it up with some protein, you've got everything you probably care to consume. But the reason that the subtitle is sort of complex it's and wordy is because I'm trying to get to where we can use these terms well and we understand how they function in uh, science. So that's what we're going to do today. And we'll probably stray from that subject matter here and there, but we'll try to stick with the program. All right. So first of all, let's get some considerations, some concepts down, okay? How about the genomic somatic components of disease, right? So we've got the genome and then we've got all the, the body of the cells, right? We've got all the other cells in the body and then we've got the genome that's, the, that's embedded in the nucleus of each of those cells. So how do those two interact, right? Particularly about disease and the disease we're gonna be looking at, right? Are those associated with obesity? But in a generic term, we can also think about anything that's pathophysiological. So there's genome modification via the immune response, which is happening all the time, 24-7, whether or not we know it. We're always fighting off invading pathogens. We're always dealing with xenobiotics and other kinds of toxins. Our body's constantly mobilized and uh, sent it in to understand all the different vagaries that can occur from the external environment. And the immune system never goes to sleep. It's always operating. Now, because of that, the genome has to tailor itself in order to deal with the immune system itself. So the immune system um, acts as a sculptor to the genome, and the genome responds by changing gene expression in given cell types um, and according to differential temporal sequences, back to time, right? You also get genome modification via turnover. By that I mean DNA replication, DNA repair, DNA recombination, as well as transcription, that is RNA synthesis, as well as translation, that is protein synthesis. All of those um, macromolecular compounds turn over. You synthesize them, they have a somewhat of a stable or metastable steady state half-life in the cell, and then they are degraded, right? That turnover includes also not just synthesis, and utilization in the cell and movement through the cell of things like DNA, RNA, protein, and of course, lipids, but also how they are eventually consumed by the cell uh, and that carbon is recommitted uh, back to the synthesis of other macromolecules or uh, the other components of the cell, such as utilization for energy. 
So that's what I mean by turnover. I mean everything, like metabolism, megatons. Then there's genome modification by the diet. So this seems kind of like, oh, I don't know, kind of weird to think about in a way, but it is what happens. In other words, the old adage, we are what we eat, is very much the case. That is, the genome is modified by how we live our lives, our, um, our lifestyle, right? The kinds of things we eat, how often we eat, how many kilocalories we consume per day. And then coupled with that is our exercise. How much energy do we dissipate, right? Do we take long walks? Do we work out in the gym? Uh, do we sit in front of a video screen all day? So those are all components of um, what overall happens between the genome and the rest of the body, the rest of the cell mass, right? And so exercise and diet kind of work hand in hand, but certainly not 50-50. And it changes with age and it's different between one sex and another. So there's a lot of differential equations one could develop for how the genome is modified by those external uh, issues, diet and exercise. And largely then we're talking again about lifestyle, right? So that's a really important thing to consider. And that's kind of what we want to like lean ourselves towards in the larger picture of what uh, living systems are all about. Um, why they get to reproductive age and start to senesce and why we eventually die, which I've been, it's a major topic. I've been talking about bear of med. If you, if you've been, uh, watching those, um, uh, presentations, then the last player in this field uh, is epigenomic modifications. And this used to be considered sort of the, uh, unusual newcomer to the field of the understanding of, uh, cellular phenomenon. Um, it really wasn't even discussed except just to have a name. It was nominal only until people started looking at the mechanism of epigenomic signatures in the cell and realized that epigenomic modifications are again the, are, are canonical with all these other modifications. So it's not simply that the genome is changed, not sequence derivative, but the genome is changed by altering gene expression. Uh, through time, through differentiation and development, but also that the epigenomic mechanisms are in operation when we alter gene expression according to uh, hormonal regulation and diet and exercise. So this is something I'm going to get into today, and hopefully you'll find it to be pretty cool, because I think it is, and I think it's something we need to consider when we're looking at how lifestyle affects uh, metabolism and how that turns into pathophysiological states such as obesity associated diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So sorry for all the words, but that's how I do this sort of thing. So there are genetic and lifestyle factors as well as gene by environment interactions. And they have been involved in the etiology of obesity. How do people get obese? By genetic and lifestyle factors and by an interaction between the genes we possess that we've inherited and how the environment modifies it. So back to genome somatic interactions, hybridization if you want. So epigenetics has arisen, as I've said, as a new tool and, and indeed a mechanistic paradigm to understand the influence of lifestyle factors on obesity. That's what we're gonna to try to like lock on today. So what does epigenetics mean? It refers to the study of changes on heredity patterns of gene expression that occur without changes in the exact DNA sequence. So we're not talking about mutations here. We're talking about things that alter how genes that are already um, embedded in the genome, how they are altered in their regulation of expression. So that's, that's kind of like the main uh, paradigmatic, canonical, architectonic understanding of epigenetics not talking about sequence variation here. So the most studied mechanisms um, in relation to obesity, and not just obesity, but disease states in general, and we, indeed uh, normal physiology, are DNA methylation and cytosine residues, uh, followed by guanines. So those are called CPG, that P stands for phosphate. Here is this uh, DNA nomenclature, uh, a quite... Uh, subducted version of DNA uh, nomenclature. But CPG just means in the sequence of DNA that you have in a gene, if you have 
high levels of CPG repeats in a given area. Those are called CPG islands or regions. And those cytosines embedded in those highly um, repeated dinucleotide systems is where you get a cytosine, which is just one of the nucleotides, right? It happens to be a pyrimidine, gets methylated. When it gets methylated, as a CH3 group is added to it, that modifies gene expression. And the methyl group can come on and off, thus it can modify the level of gene expression. There are also changes in chromatin organization by, by uh, altering via covalent modification the histones. Histones, again, are those cohering proteins that wrap the DNA into the nucleus. And there are several different forms of these histones, and some of them get covalently modified, and upon that covalent modification, alter gene expression, as you might think, as a DNA protein interaction there, of course. Now, as a sort of a, a key point to think about when we think about uh, health in the United States and indeed worldwide, is there are key windows of opportunity where genomic signatures can be altered by epigenetic phenomenon such that the rest of your life is kind of like a sequel to that. Um, that is the modification of the genome during adolescence when a lot of hormonal changes, back to endocrinology, right? A lot of hormonal changes are taking place and it's differential between men and women uh, that you live with the rest of your life. So. Adolescence is considered a very important epigenetic window over the human lifetime. So that's really important. So we think about obesity going down the age ladder, right? Obesity used to be something that was kind of late onset. People get older, they put on weight, they become more senescent, they become more relaxed, they don't do as much physical activity, they get overweight. Well, unfortunately, the obesity epidemic, we're seeing obesity in younger and younger people. And when you start to get around the adolescent stages during that pubescent era, that's when you can really modify the genome epigenetically such that um, it can cause pathophysiological states. So that's a really important thing to consider. And a lot of studies have been sort of starting to try to really go in depth and look at uh, that stage of uh, human development. Indeed, studies in obese adolescents are important because the adverse patterns of obesity-related disease begin in that period. Indeed, adolescent obesity is seen as an independent risk factor for adult cardiovascular disease. That's number one. But of course, also adolescent obesity might also be a risk factor for cancer uh, and metabolic diseases and maybe even neurological diseases. And indeed, the data is starting to suggest this. The evidence is starting to be verified that showed this. So, that might mean that even moderate weight loss could provide significant metabolic improvement in adult life. So that is when we have a, a, a young person who is just now going through adolescence, maybe the key aspect to look at here is whether or not we can get that weight down, get that weight controlled during adolescence, and then have less of a problem with it throughout life. So these are kind of commonsensical considerations. Again, sorry for all the verbiage, but we have to get through this. What's the background here? Genetic and epigenetic mechanisms shape metabolic activity, and they can respond negatively to produce a pathophysiological state. So when it's negative, we're going to say it's pathophysiological rather than when it's positive and it's just physiological changes, right? Okay. So while the genome establishes the template for developmental and metabolic patterns, so what you inherit, the genome, right, and the adaptational phenomenon, helps to produce the final phenotype. That adaptational phenomenon is where we're going to now start leaning into this epigenetic phenomenon. So the mechanism for epigenetics has become a key subject of developmental and cell biology, gene expression, and indeed disease, as I've been saying. Biochemistry of epigenetics involves several covalent modifications of nuclear chromatin, that is the DNA and the histones, as well as post-transcriptional RNA-based gene cells. And we're not going to talk about that today. We're not going to talk about microRNAs or small interfering RNAs or risk complexes. We're not going to talk about how RNA could be degraded by having complementary interfering RNA, which can interrupt translation. That's a whole other part of epigenetics. I'm not going to include that in today's talk because it, it would make this talk a lot longer than it already is. And it's long enough, believe me, it 
just looking at all the slides I've got. And, you know, when I get done with this, I want to go out and, you know, do some wood cutting. So I don't want to be doing this all day. So anyway, the modifications we're talking about here can be reversibly administered by interactions with the genome. And it's caused by res and resulting in poor nutrition and lifestyle, as well as spatiotemporal pathological metastates. So that's a big mouthful. What I mean by that is when you make these epigenetic modifications, part of it has to do with the fact that you're a heterotrophic organism. So you have changes in nutrition and lifestyle on a day-to-day -day basis and certainly throughout life. But that's the key, that there are spatiotemporal pathological metastates. In other words, different parts of your body may have different levels of pathological considerations, right? So maybe your muscle mass is being negatively impacted epigenetically, whereas your liver and your lungs are not, or it could be vice versa, right? So when we talk about epigenetics, we have to talk about location, location, location. That is, the epigenetic phenomena does not happen throughout the, all the cells in the body. It happens at specific locations at certain times, that's the spatial temporal component, uh, based on the vagaries of that genome by environment interaction, which can then lead to an epigenetic phenomenon. So that's a really key point. On the modifications, I said of methylation, again, of a specific cytosine atom, the C5 atom, um, and that's in, found in these canonical CPG islands. And the key here, the reason it affects gene expression, the CPG islands are enriched, that means there's more of them, in regions of the um, DNA which act as promoters or enhancers. Promoters or enhancers do just what they say. They promote gene expression or they enhance or they somehow modify or codify gene expression, right? So that's a really important component here is that the CPG islands are in in, are located in parts of the genome where they're going to have major effects on gene expression. Um, you also get uh, all kinds of uh, covalent modifications here uh, in the histone. So it gives those cohering proteins that wrap the DNA around the nucleus. So you get methylation, acetylation, ubiquitinylation, phosphorylation. Um, and those are like the major ones. There's even more than that. There's succinylation, for example. Uh, citrullation. So there's all kinds of covalent modification of histones, which were, before we started studying this, completely occult to the biochemist. Uh, not so anymore. Once we know something's there, we go looking for it, right? Anyways, that and, of course, the small interfering RNAs also control gene silencing, and that's mostly at the transcriptional, post-transcriptional level. So what are the enzymes that do all this work, this epigenetic work, right? Heavy lifting work. Well, they are enzymes like methyltransferases, acetyltransferases, kinases, which add phosphate, phosphatases, which remove it, and then all the other enzymes which remove, demethylases, deacetylases, E3 ubiquitin ligases, and of course, RNA enzymes themselves. Right. Substrates of the reactions uh, are either chromatin uh, or it's sometimes double-stranded messenger RNA when you're talking about interfering RNA. Again, we're not going to talk about that today. We're bracketing that off. Now, what is a methylating agent? That's the one that adds the methyl group. That is the substrate for the methylation. The by far most important methylating agent in the nucleus is s uh, Short version of that is SAM or ADOMET. Okay, it's an amino acid derivative, which is a, it has a methyl group, which can be donated. Now, that methyl group, it actually comes from folic acid. So folic acid plays a role in epigenetics, just like acid adenosylmethionine does, the availability of it. That's another whole interesting thing, the biochemical underpinnings here, uh, which I'm going to talk about sometime, is how much folic acid is used for adding methyl groups to acid adenosylmethionine so that you get enough acid adenosylmethionine that can basically carry out the business of methylation of chromatin. Okay, so that's another interesting story, which we're not going to talk about today. Okay. All right. Now, acetyl-CoA is the source of the acetate. Acetyl-CoA, dominant in all of cellular metabolism, comes from all kinds of sources. Uh, it can come from pyruvic acid, come from fatty acids, come from amino acid degradation, you name it, carbohydrate metabolism. Um, acetyl-CoA, though, that acetate is where we get the, uh, uh, the acetylation uh, 
uh, for the acetylation reactions, okay? Um, all right, so all this chromatin remodeling alters gene expression or enhances it downstream from downstream from ligand receptor mediated activation of the complex, which may be associated with these degradation pathways, these ubiquitin proteasomal pathways. So this is just nested right in the middle of what goes on in all cells. Okay, so this isn't anything peripheral or odd or or a radical about what's going on. This epigenetic stuff is just mainframe what cells do. Okay. So there are also, the, the, the thing we're talking about are these nuclear associated post-translational modifications. And again, the real key here is that this is happening on histones, okay? That histone code, modifying histone in all these ways, really tailors via a mechanism called chromatin remodeling, which I've talked about many times, um, how genes are expressed and therefore how you get a phenotype. So the major effect uh, is a of epigenet epigenetic changes is a change in the physical chemical accessibility of DNA binding proteins to unwind their double helix and then therefore potentiate transcription. So for example, first take home lesson if you want, or one of many, when you acetylate histones on specific canonical lysine residues, what you do is you open up the DNA, the DNA co uh, protein complex, the chromatin complex. When you open it up, that allows for transcription factors, RNA polymerase, single-stranded binding proteins, a whole network, a whole entourage of proteins that are going to come in and open up that DNA so that it can be transcribed. Again, once you transcribe, you make messenger RNA. The mRNA leaves the nucleus and then through lots of processing uh, in the nucleus during transport out of the nucleus and in the cytosol, then ultimately binding up with ribosomal proteins in the ribosomal complex and making protein via translation. Ultimately, you make those proteins and those proteins then are your workhorses in the cell and that's how your cell gets modified, right? So. These are all key features here, and they're all, each one of them can be modified epigenetically, actually. So let's go again into more generics about epigenetics. Every cell, of course, is an identical copy of nuclear DNA, but the expression of those genes is controlled by promoters and enhancers. Promoters are controlled by a vast array of what we call transcription factors, transacting factors, and they include proteins which bind DNA and, COVID, and then carry out sometimes covalent modification, okay? Most common covalent modification uh, in, of DNA, of DNA, not the histones now, is the methylation of that cytosine, that C5 atom on cytosine. Methylation of promoter in general shuts down or decreases, turns the volume down of transcription, okay? You get this bulky hydrophobic methyl group, and what it does is it makes it so that the enzymes that would normally transcribe cannot get that transcription bubble to function so you don't get gene expression at that particular location. So we call that silencing. It's a term that's been bandied around for decades now. And that methylation pattern is transferred mitotically, that means during cell division, and also meiotically. That is, it can make it into the haploid genome. Okay? That's also really important. Factors which affect control over methylation then control gene expression. So anything behind that, anything upstream from that methylation is going to be then a controlling factor. So that's what we want to look at. What's doing that? What's controlling that? And that's where the kinase is going to come in in a super cool way. Uh, besides this phenomenon, gene expression is controlled via chromatin remodeling, as I've been saying, uh, that it's just a modification of the protein DNA interactions and uh, the ubiquitin pathway. So all modifications of genes other than change in DNA sequence that suffers are epigenetics. The epigenetic modification includes the addition of the methyl groups to the backbone. Adding the groups changes the appearance and structure. We call it the physical chemical properties of DNA. And those changes are how genes interact with each other and other molecules in the cell's nucleus. It's a very complex axial network involved here. Now, let's back up a little bit and think about like every day. You know that you in general, receive one copy of uh, your genes from your mother, another copy of that set of genes from your father. You know that you're a diploid organism. You have at least two copies of every gene. Now, sometimes you have multiple copies. 
The reason that is because of gene duplication. And sometimes you only get one because of gene subtraction. Right? Now, parental end printing comes in here. An addition of a methyl group to DNA is used by the cell system for some genes to distinguish copy number. So, and also to distinguish between father inheritance and mother inheritance, right? paternal and maternal inheritance. That's called imprinting. So it distinguishes each gene copy that provides additional information to the cell. So in other words, the cell is able to recognize when, where you got that gene from, from either mama or papa. Now that has an effect on the gene's expression. So what that does is perform what's called copy prejudice for making certain proteins. So sometimes if you have a maternal copy of the gene, it doesn't get expressed, only the paternal one does. Sometimes that's reversed. And those changes and those differential effects on which copy gets expressed is called copy prejudice. Okay. Now, that's really important because if you have a maternal gene that's methylated and it's silenced because of it, if that's done naturally by methylation patterns, not by any kind of vagary of parental environment by genome interaction, such as starvation, drug addiction, alcoholism or something, then that methylation pattern or that methylome, let's say on the maternal genome, is supposed to be in place. And that means that if you alter that and you get the maternal copy of the gene expressed because you lose the methyl group, sometimes you've got too much gene dosage. And when you have too much gene dosage of like a regulatory protein, like a transcription factor, for example, that can cause problems. What kind of problems? Cancer, for example. Okay, so very important stuff, that imprinting. All right, this slide here is showing you how you can modify the chromatin. So here you've got a, uh, this K means lysine, right? So you've got methyl transferases and demethylases. You can add a methyl group to lysines. You can pull it off on a histone tail. You can phosphorylate it at serine or threonine residues. There's also a protein which will add methyl groups to arginine. And when it does that, that methylated arginine can um, actually um, be, uh, um, the arginine within the protein can be converted to citrulline. And when that happens, that's kind of interesting, right? When that happens by the enzyme PADI, um, it, it's not always good for the protein. In fact, increases in PADI activity, which were superimposed and caused by this methylation of that arginine residue on given proteins, right? That can actually be associated with several nasty diseases. Alzheimer's, MS, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, another autoimmune disease, uh, Parkinson's disease, and in fact, many forms of cancers. This is a really a hot target in pharmacotherapy, actually. So you got that. Then you've got yet another lysine residue that can be acetylated, okay? And you acetylate it by HAT, that's histone acetyltransferase, or you can remove it by the histone deacetylase enzymes, right? We talked about sirtuins being involved here, right? Don't worry about it now. I'm not going to mention it again. But in previous talks, you remember we talked about sirtuins. That's what we're talking about, HDAX. Now, then we've got this whole DNA methyl, uh, methylation, okay, directly on the DNA. And we just already talked about CPG islands. You put, the D you put the methyl group on, you can take it off. All of these are, you know, completely uh, transmutable. You can add those covalent modifications, but you can pull them back off. And you're going to alter gene expression in real time. So here's the metabolic paradigm about all of this epigenetic background. Homeostatic regulation of metabolism disease susceptibility meet at the crossroads of epigenetic modification. Okay? So that's what we want to talk about today. It's the core of this talk. And to get into that, I'm using as an example a protein called adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase, AMP kinase, AMPK. Those are kinases which have their claim to fame. They were first really discovered because those kinases covalently modify, they phosphorylate two key enzymes, acetylcocarboxylase and hydroxymethylglucose reductase. ACCase, that is the enzyme which commits carbon via the synthesis of malonyl-CoA to fatty acid synthesis. Whereas HMG-CoA reductase, that commits carbon to cholesterologenesis. 
So why is that important? Well, basically, what are those? Those are anabolic pathways, making fatty acids, making cholesterol. It takes a lot of energy to do that. And it, it's for synthesis of membranes, the synthesis of storage carbon, such as triacylglycerol. So AMP kinase then is going to shut that down. So the metabolic grid we're talking about here is really cool. AMP kinase is going to be that molecular switch that says, shut down the synthesis of storage compounds, shut down the synthesis of membrane. And when you do that, you know what happens? You don't make membrane, guess what? You can't do cell division. So that also causes cell quiescence, right? Cells stop dividing. Now, this is, of course, a key switch. When cells divide when they're not supposed to, what do we call that? Cancer, right? When cells don't divide and they're supposed to, what do we call that? Apoptosis, senescence, all kinds of things can be on the other side. So there's a darkness and a light on each one of those aspects, right? And AMP kinase is right there regulating this stuff. And as we see what regulates AMP kinase, is fundamental to bioenergetics and canonical metabolic regulation in the cell. That's why I think AMP kinase is such a cool item. So, okay, why is it called AMP kinase? Because it's activated by AMP. What's AMP? Adenosyl monophosphate. We're going to talk about where that comes from. Really, it's the ratio of AMP to ATP, and that's all embedded in something called the energy charge of the cell, which I'm going to show you in a moment. So when you took biochemistry from me years ago, I spent a lot of time talking about things like energy charge. Talked a lot about adenylate uh, kinase and about how you can make ATP from ADP and you can make AMP and ADP from ATP. There's a lot of interactions there, right? Well, we don't, people, we don't often talk about that, although I still do in every biochemistry class I teach. It's often not discussed, yet it needs to be understood because understanding the energy charge of the cell helps explain why AMP kinase is that molecular switch. If you don't know that, then all you're doing is memorizing it. You're not really understanding it. And what we need to do is generate a narrative in, in understanding science for, for physicians and for veterinarians and for everybody, including lay people that aren't going to be professional scientists, or professional healthcare people need to understand why AMP is so important and where it comes from and how it's removed. Again, if you don't have adequate amounts of AMP, you don't affect this enzyme. The enzyme requires it. You don't do that. You don't get all the things it regulates. So you understand the full picture. You got to know where it comes from. So AMP kinase acts as an effector kinase in bioenergetics. An effector kinase. That means it affects something. It causes things. Right? It's, it's actually doing the heavy lifting, right? AMP kinase is regulatory of metabolism and cell fate. Control, for example, apoptosis or cell division. AMP kinase is also associated, of course, with the immune response. Again, the immune response, 24-7, it's always operating. It's not only when you get an influenza virus or a cold virus or you get bacterial infection from eating bad food at uh, the company picnic, right? The immune system is always working, always surveilling, always sculpting via genome environment interaction all the time, all the way until you die. Okay. And kindness is involved in that, of course. So, don't say energy charge. Think about, again, this concept of blood glucose. Everybody knows what that is, right? So, you have a high level of circulating blood glucose. That's not a good thing if it doesn't go down after you eat. What makes blood glucose levels decrease is the secretion of insulin from the pancreas. That insulin causes glucose to be taken up by cells and then converted either to glycogen, which is a storage form of glucose, polyglucose, or it can be converted metabolically directly to energy, ATP, like in glycolysis in the TCA cycle, or that carbon from glucose, of course, once insulin causes it to be taken up by the cells, can be converted to fat. And we're oligenous organisms, so any excess calories, that's where they go. Right? That's where we put on storage fat. Now, obviously, fasting or high-fat, a ketogenic diet is going to affect blood glucose. Because not only do you deal with dietary glucose, the body also quite easily, thank you, can make glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. We call that gluconeogenesis. More on that in a moment. Now, that's linked to this energy charge because glu glucose metabolism involves ATP synthesis and utilization. So metabolic changes accompany numerous 
central nervous system disorders. Now, why am I bringing that up here? Because you don't normally think about it. You normally think about how, oh, you eat food, you digest it, the carbon gets converted to what the body needs, end of story, full stop. Not the case. The central nervous system is always preoccupied with digestion. Believe it or not. Yeah, of course you know this, right? That's where the appetite of control comes from, right? When you when you no longer are hungry because you're full, what do you think that message is being received? It's received in the brain, right? So you're talking CNS. So there are metabolic changes that accompany CNS disorders. So we're back into understanding this at multiple levels. So purines, which are things which have the purine adenosine or adenine, they could also have guanine, but this particular purine that has ATP or adenosine, that purine molecule, are poised to translate. That is to carry out some kind of like coded information to be understood by the rest of the cell. How much energy is there and whether or not neuronal activity has to adjust to that overall energy budget. Does it by bioenergetics, that is the utilization and synthesis of ATP, and indirectly by this thing called energy charge. So energy charge, by definition, is the amount of ATP plus half the amount of AT ADP, that's adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphate. Remember that, that those phosphates are uh, alpha, beta, gamma, the gamma phosphoryl, the one that's way out, way out there on the third, the third phosphate from the end, uh, at the end of the molecule, that's the one that gets hydrolyzed when you use ATP. ATP goes to ADP. But you can also get that beta phosphoryl. That will also get the same amount of chemical energy. So when we talk about energy charge, only half the ADP molecule is functional there because you only have one phosphate from which to hydrolyze, from which to gain metabolic energy, okay? Kilocalories and all that. So ATP plus half ADP divided by ATP plus ADP plus AMP, the third adenylate, the third purine here. That phosphate on AMP is not utilized for energy transduction or, or bioenergetics to any meaningful degree, at least not canonically and linearly. Here's glycolysis. I know you guys dig this. Um, so at rest, what happens? Glycolysis gets inhibited. Why is that? Why doesn't glycolysis just means the the um, oxidation of glucose, not using oxygen, of course, but um, the eventual oxidation of glucose to carbon dioxide, the beginning of it to carbon dioxide. Okay, uh, and so, but it also glycolysis also is the utilization of glucose to make things. Right. So, what goes on here? Right. Well, it's an oxidation. So you make glu you take glucose to pyruvate, which is a carboxylic acid. So how does glucose enter this pathway via an enzyme called hexokinase? Hexokinase is feedback inhibited by its product, glucose 6-phosphate. One way glycolysis is controlled. But the rest of the pathway, arguably, now there's all kinds of interesting covalent modification, allosteric effectors like fructose 2 6 bis phosphate controlling phosphofructokinase 1 via phosphofructokinase 2, all that business I know I've talked about other times, and some of you probably know what I'm saying. Others just sounds like a bunch of words, but trust me, the rest of glycolysis could be arguably controlled just by energy charge. High energy charge means a lot of ATP, which is an ultimate product of this reaction sequence. Okay, High amounts of ATP over the amounts of AMP understood via that ratio we just looked at, that energy charge ratio. Okay, what that does is shut down glycolysis. It inhibits phosphofructokinase 1, inhibits pyruvate kinase, and because of that, glycolysis turns down. Okay, so you don't metabolize glucose. That has a lot of ramifications, right? Because if you're not metabolizing glucose, it means you start storing it. And that means you can back up from uptake from the serum. That means you can have a lot of circulating glucose, high levels of circulating glucose postprandially, Insulin no longer being effective, insulin insensitivity. What are we talking about here? Diabetes type 2. That's right. So you see how this all works into, we know that, that type 2 diabetes is associated, correlated with obesity. It's one of those, those diseases, pathophysiologies, it's well correlated. So you see how this energy charge is all associated. So 
let's get now into some nitty gritty. It's really cool stuff. Let's think about pharmacological um, interventions. So metformin is often used for people, adolescents, for example, if they're a little bit overweight and it looks like they may have a little bit of problem with glucose control in the serum. What does that metformin do? It actually inhibits the NADH oxidase reaction right here. Okay. So it inhibit, this is the uh, mitochondrial electron transport chain. There are multiple complexes. Complex one oxidizes NADH to NAD. Transfers electrons, kicks protons out into the uh, intermembrane space. It generates a proton motive force and ultimately way out of complex five, you make ATP. Okay, Glucose oxidation and utilization makes NADH. NADH gets reoxidized in the mitochondria. When that oxidation occurs, you generate an electron motive force. Electrons are transferred through these multiple complexes, which are uh, iron and copper containing heme type proteins at various oxidation states. <clears throat> when that goes down, ultimately proton motive force causes ATP synthesis. This is oxidative phosphorylation electron transport. Okay. So what metformin does, it blocks the very first reaction. So what that means is what? You don't make NAD. You don't make NAD, you can't run glycolysis. Okay. Not only that, you're not making ATP. Okay. If you're not making ATP, what's going on? You don't have energy to synthesize glucose. So metformin inhibits gluconeogenesis, you see, because you don't have enough ATP, because ATP is needed to synthesize glucose. That's what gluconeogenesis is. So main effect of the drug is to acutely decrease hepatic gluconeogenesis. This is what you need when you're trying to impact diabetes. Right? You don't want any sugar production in the liver. Even though you have high circulating glucose, that's what happens in diabetes type 2. Now, that's mostly tr through this transit inhibition of the complex 1, which is 90H oxidase. Now, in addition to this, the resulting decrease in hepatic energy status means that you get a decrease in ATP, you alter that ratio, ATP to AMP, what do you think happens? AMP kinase is kicked in. AMP kinase then is a metabolic sensor. AMP kinase then is a downstream target of metformin. Okay. Now, I just want to maybe disabuse you to, re to, to understand something about how you make glucose in the liver. And the liver is the primary organ that makes the glucose. So the carbon that you're using to make that glucose is not from carbohydrate. It's from non-carbohydrate precursors. Is it from lipid? Can you convert lipid into carbohydrate? You can in bacteria. You can in some other lower life forms. Certainly higher plants you can do this because all of those other organisms, not higher animals, have a system called the glyoxylate cycle. That's over here. And the glyoxylate cycle is basically a shunt around the TCA cycle. Watch what happens here. So TCA cycle, you've got acetyl-CoA coming in, right, binding with oxaloacetic acid. Oxaloacetic acid with citrate uh, synthase makes citrate. Citrate then converted to isocitrate, and if you continue down the TCA cycle, you'd ultimately make malate this way. But there's an enzyme in plants and uh, microbes called isocitrate lyase, which makes this two-carbon compound called glyoxylate. Glyoxylate, with the second reaction, which we don't have, we don't have isocitrate lyase, so we don't have malate synthase, the second reaction, we'll take another mole of acetyl-CoA, react it with glyoxylate to make malate. Malate then will make OAA, and OAA will make glucose. So plants can convert fat into glucose. Animals can't because we don't have isocitrate lyase and malate synthase. Right? So fatty acyl coas, when through beta oxidation make acetate, can be readily converted to make glucose in plants and microbes, can't in animals, for, for example, humans. So this is not a pathway that happens. Okay, not a pathway. That's a really important thing to keep in mind. Okay. Almost said the next slide there is if somebody was pushing the slides for me. All right, here comes a really recent paper, European Journal of Endocrinology. This is talking about AMP kinase. I know it's a busy slide, but let's go through it. First of all, AMP kinase has a catalytic alpha subunit and two regulatory subunits, so it's trimeric. 
It's activated by a phosphorylation of a threonine residue on the alpha subunit by two kinases, LKP1 and calcium MKK beta. It's also, as we have already been saying, allosterically activated by AMP. In fact, when AMP allosterically activates it, it induces the phosphorylation of that threonine, thus making the fully functional AMP kinase, which at the same time inhibits a phosphatase. So now what's interesting here about this paper is that we're talking about AMP kinase activity, not in the liver or muscle, where you might think, well, there's a metabolic sensor there, right? You've got you got to make more ATP or you got to stop making ATP, that kind of thing in muscle or liver. Guess what? The hypothalamus is also highly involved in this metabolic regulation, as you might guess, because the brain, hypothalamus is in the central nervous system, is what's going to control appetite, okay? So let's take a look at this. <clears throat> so hypothalamus here and also part of the hindbrain is involved. So what happens here? Positive AMP kinase induction include a couple of adipokines, adiponectin, AGRP, also interestingly can cannabinoids, that is endocannabinoids like enandamide, right? Not the cannabinoids that people smoke or eat from the cannabis plant, but the endogenous cannabino cannabinoids endocannabinoids, ghrelin, right, growth hormone, releasing hormone, ghrelin, right, a stomach hormone that is actually octinylated, sent to the brain and induces, induces this is all going to induce feeding, okay? So the brain's receiving these signals because you don't have enough carbon in the system, okay? Certain glucocorticoids and hypoglycemia will all induce this. Now, what it blocks that are all these other hormones. That's why it's about endocrinology, right? Not just hormones like uh, glucagon-like protein 1, but also glucagon, glucose itself, insulin, lactate, leptin, and adipokine, uh, T3, that's thyroxin, vitamin B1, uh, you know, citrate, intermediate and TCA cycle, lots of things are going to want to block this. All of these are the well-fed state, right? Now, Glucagon isn't, but glucagon is a negative effector here because glucagon is more interested that the hormone is more involved in the regulation of non-endocrine control. That is all the peripheral, non-CNS associated, right? So when glucagon is making it to the brain, which it actually does, that's a different story. That means that it's regulating this and actually the opposite effect it does in other organs. Don't worry about that. Just if you see that and you go, wait, why? That's weird. Not weird because you have metabolic zonation. What happens in the brain in terms of off on is different than what happens in the liver, in the uh, kidney, in the adipose tissue, in the skeletal muscle, in the endothelium, you name it. Okay, uh, GI tract, different. All right. Anyways, in the brain. That's what goes on. That's what controls this. Okay, now, this all, if this is on correctly and you're not inhibiting it by these uh, hormones and by these intermediates and by the metabolites, you kick on this particular um, kinase, uh, calcium MKK beta, the LKB1, and that phosphorylates because of high ratio of AMP to ADP. Why is that important? Because the kinase isn't going to be receptive to those the AMP kinase is going to be receptive until AMP allosterically activates it. Then it's receptive, you see, to these two kinases, which are being signaled by the hypothalamus. It's all happening in the hypothalamus. Okay. All right. AMP kinase is not fully functional. you got the threonine phosphorylated because of these two kinases. Uh, this is just the, 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 if you want to know what each of these compounds are, there's their definitions there. Now, interestingly enough, once you get all this set up and you've got this AMP bound, you got this kinase reactions, actually that inhibits, that inhibits this phosphatase. So there's a phosphatase which wants to strip off that uh, alkaline labile phosphate on the AMP kinase, on threonine 172. Why does it want to do that? Because it wants to autoregulate. It wants to turn down the AMP kinase. But when the AMP kinase is fully functional, it shuts off the phosphatase. So obviously when this ratio goes back down, when AMP goes down, ATP goes up, phosphatase comes in, strips off that phosphate, everything goes the other way. It tumbles backwards, goes back down to a resting state where AMP kinase is barely negligibly active. See? 
So what does AM Kinase do? It shuts down ATP consuming processes. We already mentioned them. You know them now. You are now a student that is aware. What are two main ones? Fatty acid synthesis via the shutdown of acetylcholine oxalase. And what's the other one? That's correct. HMG coil reductase, which shuts down cholesterol genesis. Those are two major ATP consuming processes. The other ones, of course, but lipid biochemists, lipids are really cool. Lipids are where it's at. That's what we're talking about. You know, deal with it. Okay. So it also shuts down energy expenditure like thermogenesis, like generating heat. Okay. The body doesn't want to like expend energy by generating heat when it's trying to get energy in. So you have kind of shuts that down at the whole body level. Again, a major metabolic switch, right? At the same time, it's going to generate ATP producing processes and it's going to, it's going to also induce energy uptake. That's where the hypothalamus is involved. Okay. In other words, this is where the appetitive or appetite control is, right? Appetite control is going to, amp kinase is going to regulate how much you want to eat. It makes you hungry. Okay. So that's called orexigenic. Orexigenic means you get hungry. And the way that happens is in the central nervous system, there is a signaling that goes on, which turns on whatever necessary components in the brain are, ne are, are involved in the appetitive mode, which, which makes you feel hungry, right? That's how you feel hungry at the central nervous system level. Okay. So the activation of AMP kinase increases appetite. AMP kinase is highly expressed in the arcuate, that's the arc, dorsomedial, paraventricular, and ventromedial nuclei, as well as the lateral hypothalamic area. That's all part of the hypothalamus. So this is really well described. So I'm telling you all this neuroscience, right? So therefore, hypothalamic AMP is a part of the adaptive change in physiological regulation of feeding. Turns on appetite, okay? Fasting increases, but refeeding inhibits, as you would think, amp kinase activity in the hypothalamus, okay, in all those regions, in the ARC, PBH, BMH, etc. Okay, that's key. So hypothalamic amp kinase dominant negative. When you have a form of the protein which is non-functional, and we're going to have that would be called the dominant negative. That decreases the expression, the reason we know it's linked, of all the orexigenic neuropeptides. Those are the peptides which induce appetite. What are they? Again, now we're going to name them a goody related peptide, that's AGRP, and the neuropeptide Y, and those are found in the ar arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. Overexpression of AMP kinase constitutively active. When you have a constitutively active one, that means the phosphorylation is not now afforded. In fact, all you got to do is replace that. The threonine with something like aspartate. Okay. When you have that, it elevates fasting induced expression of those two orexigenic peptides in the ARC, as well as in the expression of another hormone called melanin concentrating hormone MCH, all in the LHA, all in, the, all in that region of the uh, lateral, lateral part of the hypothalamus. Okay. So that is really important. That is the constitutively expressed AMP kinase dysregulates this whole response, right? It's always on then. You're always feeling hungry. You're always making these orexigenic peptides. That means if there's a mutation in the AMP kinase or an alteration in the expression, in epigenetics here, because of obesity, for example, you constantly feel hungry because you're making these orexigenic peptides. You see how obesity is linked here? We have endocrinology and epigenetics. That's the focus of this little talk. All right, so AMP kinase modulates expression of NPY and pro opio melanocortin or pump. Okay, that's a key, <laughs> that's a key player in all this. I don't want to get into POMC right now. Um, but it's also involved in producing encephalins and endorphins, and those are uh, peptides which makes you feel at ease, right? Those are actually called endorphins, right? So endorphins are the endogenous compounds which bind to the, recept the opiate receptors. Okay? So this is also why people feel relaxed and mellowed out because that hormonal complex is also turned on in the brain, right? That is, that's why when you start eating, you feel good. See? All right. And that is all related to the phagus response, eating response. So sorry about this. I'm going to go through it real quickly. Here are all those regions. 
of hypothalamus, right? They're blown up here. Here are all of those peptides and hormones we talked about, how they're affecting AMP kinase, right? Uh, this particular paper wants to tell you maybe an anti-obesity drug could come in here. Why is that? If you can shut down AMP kinase, if you can tune that down in the hypothalamus, in that particular region in the arcuate of the hypothalamus, you're going to cause what? You're going to cause a decrease in the production of those uh, orexigenic peptides, right? When you Like NPY um, or the AG. And when you do that, you're going to decrease the appetite. So that's why there are drugs that are, are targeted for that region. Now, again, what does AMP kinase normally do? All these things, right? It's going to negatively affect uh, thermogenesis. It's going to increase food intake. It's going to affect metabolism in the liver. Interestingly enough, okay, and this is not a sympathetic nervous system we're talking about, right? Interestingly enough, when you, what AMP kinase is functional at, Okay, we won't get into this, but this is now the pre-prodromal stage of the deep secrets we're going to talk about in this lecture. Uh, what's going to happen is you're going to get a browning of white adipose tissue. What does that browning mean? It means it's getting a darker color, kind of reddish brown. Where does reddish brown come from? Iron. What organelle is a lot of iron? Mitochondria. So this is an induction of mitochondrial genesis. AMP kinase. It's going to work epigenetically to cause mitochondria to be produced in cells like adipose, like WAT, white adipose tissue, to turn it into brown fat or beige fat, not quite complete brown fat. We have uncoupling proteins in thermogenesis, for example, like in rat uh, or in mouse. No, not so much of that in adult humans, but you make beige adipose. And that, I know it's terrible, and I didn't think of this. Some people who thought they were clever did. I really don't like terms like that, but there they are. Just simply means you make more mitochondria, more mitochondria, and more what? Fatty acid oxidation, more oxidative phosphorylation. So you can make more ATP. Isn't that what AMP, AMP kinase wants to do? It wants to produce more energy. More mitochondria produces more energy. Okay. Uh, obviously, it's going to have impact on the organs involved in insulin and glucagon production, and it's going to have a big impact on muscle tissue as well. Why? Because muscle also carries out lipid oxidation. Yeah, because of what? intramuscular triacylglycerol, intramuscular lipid, IML. Key component in a good active muscle tissue is having a lot of IML that can be called upon during uh, muscle contraction. Finally, we get to this paper. New paper, uh, well, seven months ago. I'm, pu I'm publishing this in August of 2017. Uh, okay, so this paper came out in January this year in Science Signaling, one of my favorite journals. I'm sure if you've been watching the stuff I do, you know I love this journal. So what does it talk about? Here we go. Dysregulation of mitochondrial biogenesis and function corrupts ATP synthesis, because mitochondria is where you make most of the ATP, and can, where's the other place, glycolysis and the cytosol. Now that then can result in a lot of electrons being converted to molecular oxygen that is partially reducing molecular oxygen. You make reactive oxygen, that's bad, ROS, at least can be mutational. It can also modify calcium signaling and misdirect fatty acid oxidation, of course, because you have problems with mitochondrial genesis. That means fatty acid oxidation is messed with, amino acid oxidation is altered, urea genesis is altered, okay, all the ammonia that's coming in to these cells can now not be converted to urea, but uh, ammonia levels can become toxic and build up. These are all things that can happen in late stage, more abundant obesity, by the way. It can corrupt the TCA cycle, again, by altering NADH and NAD ratios for one way. AMP kinase, again, is going to be um, inferred and regulated by that because you're making NADH in that pathway. NADH, if you're not correctly blocking it, you're going to make a lot of ATP, you're going to corrupt the AMP kinase signal. That's going to link into ketogenesis. And all of that is ultimately switched on and on by AMP kinase. So when you dysregulate mitochondrial biogenesis, you cause a lot of pathophysiology. Let's get into this. AMP kinase is involved in energy homeostasis. I think you can buy that now. AMP kinase regulation is linked into and activated by canonical phosphorylation, single transduction, the endocrine we just talked about, pathways. Uh, the liver kinase B1, the calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase, kinase beta, that uh, other kinase, the activated AMP kinase, where we saw that. A different thing here, another player, 
a purine intermediate during purine uh, genesis is called ACAR. That's 5 amino imidazole, 4 carboxamide ribonucleotide. It's actually a, a pharmacotherapeutic. Uh, that and metformin and actually pulsatile shear stress and muscle tissue all activate up kind. So why would ACAR activate it? It's a precursor to adenosine. Simple. So phospho-AMK phosphorylates downstream signaling cascades, something we haven't talked about yet, but we will. Major contributor of mitochondrial biogenesis and the bioenergetic competence is via phosphorylation of a transcription factor called peroxisome proliferative activated receptor gamma coactor, coactivator 1-alpha, conveniently called PGC1-alpha. PGC1-alpha is a transcription factor that becomes phosphorylated by AP kinase, which works in the nucleus, which turns on mitochondrial genesis. Okay, kind of story. PGC1-alpha then is the key transcription factor for mitochondrial <coughs> biogenesis. It induces transcription of the nuclear respiratory factors, NERF 1 and 2. NERFs increase transcription of the ultimate transcription factor A, called TPAM, um, and that induces mitochondrial gene expression. Also causes mitochondrial DNA replication, because you need that every time you make new mitochondria, of course. Remember, the mitochondrial genome plays a role here in mitochondrial competency, because some of the gene products of the mitochondria are in the electron transport chain. All right, so here's a paper that came out recently. Um, this is interesting. So high levels of free fatty acids are taken up by these receptors. I've talked about them before, fatty acid binding protein, as well as the CD36 orphan receptor. Fatty acids come into the cytosol. They can be used to make these intramuscular triacylglycerols. Okay? As you increase the amount of free fatty acids, you turn on peroxone proliferative activated receptor. That's a transcription factor. Okay? You also, because you start to decrease glycogen in active muscle, Okay, this is active muscle. You turn on P38, you turn on AMP kinase. Now, this is like muscle tissue, okay? Just bear with me and watch this. AMP kinase then phosphorylates P53. P36 phosphorylates PGC1. We just talked about that. You make the NERF genes in the nucleus. Those then are going to transactivate the production of more PGC1. Um, you're going to make COX subunits, that, uh, that whole pathway is involved in lipid oxidation. Don't worry about it right now. But here are all these other transcription factors, TFAM, DRIP1, MFN2. You're also going to uptick carnitine palmitoyl transferase. You're going to make more CD36. You're taking more fatty acids and also this protein kinase 4. <clears throat> so you're going to make more mitochondria. You're going to get DNA replication of the mitochondria. You're going to make all these genes, but you're going to make the mitochondrial competent so that you get in fully functional, active, increase in mitochondria in those cells, okay? And AMP kinase, as you see, is a major player in all that, okay? Linked fatty acid metabolism. We're not going to talk much more about that now because I want to hit on this epigenetics. And again, I want to be done because I want to go out and cut wood. It's a beautiful day. Totally selfish. AMP kinase epigenetically enhances mitochondrial genesis. That's take-home message number whatever, 10. Okay, phosphorylation of a key DNA methyltransferase, a histone acetyltransferase. Remember these from way back in the talk? Remember back when my hair was less uh, gray? Like way back. I don't know how long ago that was. Not a long time ago. Uh, but remember the DNA methyltransferases? Well, DNM, DNM uh, T1, we're going to start calling it. Histone acetyltransferase, that's called HAT, good, yeah, easy to remember. There's also another gene which is going to be turned on via phosphorylation via AMP kinase, which is a coactivator. All of that got to promote the new formation of new mitochondria. How cool is that? So here we go. It's from Back to Science Signaling paper, published uh, seven months ago now. So the people that did this study were very careful to look at the fine granularity of the promoter regions of these genes. Here's DNMT1. Here's this RBPP7. This is a cofactor for stimulating HAT. And here's HAT. All of these have in their promoter regions phosphorylation sites and phosphorylation sites. They also have a whole other sequence like a methyltransferase, nuclear localization sequences to make these proteins functional and coherently either activated or deactivated by AMP kinase. Every one of them are altered by AMP kinase. That's the key feature here, see? 
Amp Kinase Festival Relation Site, Amp Kinase Festival Relation Site, and the HAT1 also. Okay, so these are the promoter regions of these genes. And they have a lot of other decoration, molecular decoration, which controls their expression, as you might guess, right? Because they're involved in epigenetics. Remember, these are all epigenetic systems controlled now by amp kinase. Okay? Now, we did the whole thing about appetite. We did a little bit about metabolism with the amp kinase, right? The browning of the mitochondria, okay? Converted to beta oxidation of fatty acids, all that kind of stuff. We already talked about that. Now we're talking about the, the newest feature of this, why this paper is so cool and why it was in Science Signaling seven months ago, because it's involved at an epigenetic level. So what happens is the AMP kinase actually, when it phosphorylates DNMT1, it turns it off. It means that that enzyme no longer can methyl transfer to cytosine residues on promoter regions of other genes involved in whatever that's going to do. So in other words, when you don't have methylation signatures, you get more gene expression. So it tunes down, it, turn, it turns down that amplitude, that signal, that sound wave for methyl transferase. You get less methylation, you get more gene expression. Okay. Likewise, it does, when it phosphorylates this uh, coactivator of HAT, it turns it on and it turns on HAT. Remember that HAT, the transfer of acetate to lysine residues in histones, canonical histone residues and canonical histones in the chromatin, that then opens up the chromatin and allows for gene expression. That modifies via chromatin remodeling all those promoters like for PGC1-alpha, NERF, TFAM, and also actually uncoupling protein, interesting, and you get mitochondrial biogenesis and function tuned up by AMP kinase. Uh, this is some data just showing you if you convert the serine 730 to an alanine, you don't in each one of these cases get uh, incorporation of P32. So it is this residue we're talking about. Not that threonine residue, a serine residue. A unique residue comes phosphorylated by M kinase. What's the surprise here? You get multiple sites for phosphorylation. <laughs> this is showing you if you inhibit uh, the AMP kinase what, with the C, C pro, uh, the C peptide protein, the C blocker, you get no phosphorylation of these proteins. And when you just add gamma P32, radioactive P32, and you don't have the inhibitor, and you have AMP kinase, you do get phosphorylation of all three of those proteins. That's what that signal is supposed to show you. All right, more data from the paper. AMP kinase dependent phosphorylation of DNMT cuts it down. It de decreases the methylation activity in both ACAR and metformin. Work through this axis. Why is that? Because again, ACAR and metformin are functioning, ACAR is functioning to increase the amount of adenosine. And it's also an anti-diabetic drug. And so it's going to increase the amount of AMP kinase activity because it's going to give you more AMP. Likewise, metformin, remember, it's going to inhibit NADH oxidation. So you're going to have what? You're going to have less ATP, increase AMP. You're going to get an effect. So this phosphorylation turns down that methyl transferase activity. So look at that. By decreasing the amount of epigenetic activity of this methyl transferase on those cytosine residues on that chromatin, you're going to have less when you, in the presence of compounds, pharmacotherapeutics, for example, that enhance AMP kinase, you're going to have less activity. Okay. Same thing happens here. Okay, here's the activity, the extra activity of it. This is looking at control. Here's uh, AMP kinase when you have it there. When you have AMP kinase, right, you get less DNMT activity, which is what you'd guess. Without AMP kinase, it, has no, it doesn't decrease. It doesn't kick down that methyl transfer. So AMP kinase is required for that decrease in activity. X figure, okay? Again, we're looking at promoter methylation here. Here are all the different genes we talked about, right? Okay, here's the control. Here's adding ACAR or metformin. Here are, whenever you have AMP kinase, what's going on? You're getting a decrease in methylation of all those genes. So the activity at DNMT1 is to methylate those genes. It's down south now because you've decreased the DNMT activity, which we just showed you, right? However, here, right, when you when you don't have AMP kinase, there's no effect, right? So AMP kinase is required for this diminution of methylation of these promoters. Okay? And then when you decrease the promote uh, the methylation of these promoters, what do you think happens to these genes? They're turned up. They're turned up because these are all genes involved in mitochondrial genesis. So here we go. AMP kinase phosphorylation and DNMT1 decreases the methylation of promoters for several mitochondrial biogenesis transcription factors. That's what these dudes are. 
transcription factors. So they're really master regulators. And from the journal Inter International Journal of Biological Sciences, published two years ago now, ACAR, amongst other things, suppresses tag accumulation because it's going to be decreasing what? Anabolic pathways, like in increase the amount of stored lipid. It also increases AKT phosphorylation. Now, that's interesting because AKT is involved in that mTOR activity in terms of are you going to be anabolic or catabolic. So there's going to be a little bit of a problem here, sort of a twist in the system because AKT, you would normally think would be working opposite AMP kinase, actually it's used as a modulator, right? It's going to modulate the activity of AMP kinase because AKT itself, when it's phosphorylate, has to control via background signaling the overall potency of AMP kinase without going directly through mTOR. If you don't know what I mean about all this, it's okay. But if you do, hopefully now you're starting to see how this fits together. And if you don't, all I'm telling you is that this fits with our understanding of metabolic regulation. Okay, Metformin, amongst a lot of other things, because of that NADH activity, decreases a protein called the junk kinase. And it also decreases M38 MAP kinase. These are all, these are all when those are turned on, not decrease, but increase, that's all anabolic. Okay. So we already said that ACR and metformin activate AMPK. Therefore, regulation is dependent on AMPK activation. Okay. That's what that whole story is. That's why I brought in that paper, just to give you a more intimate detail. All right. Now back to our science signaling paper from this year. HAD activity is enhanced by AMP kinase phosphorylation of HAD. Okay, so here's control in the presence of ACAR and metformin. These are, again, are helping stimulate by having AMP available. You need an AMP available for AMP kinase to be allosterically modified to accept this phosphorylation cascade. Then it's going to also cause HAT1 activity to increase because it's going to phosphorylate that acetyl transferase. And see here, when there's no AMP kinase, there's no effect. So AMP kinase is necessary for this activity. It's necessary, right? Okay. So AMP kinase, again, must be activated, and I told you I was activated. More from this paper. Okay. Again, now we're looking at the, the product of that, hat trans, that, that histone ace, uh, acetyltransferase. Do you get acetylation? Of these transcription factors. Yep, 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 and yep. Okay, so the control is less, and each one of the other systems are getting more. And the, well, in the absence of AMP kinase, you don't have an effect. I'm sorry. In the presence of AMP kinase, you increase the amount of acetylation of that particular histone, and that's going to then uptick this the transcription factor of PGC1 alpha, TFAM. And when you don't have AMP kinase, you don't get that increase. Okay. So mitochondrial biogenesis. Oh, this is wild type versus here's where you got rid of the active serine. You can't phosphorylate it. No effect from ACAR or metformin. No effect from um, AMP kinase. When you convert the serine to an aspartate, it becomes constitutive. Remember way back when I told you about constitutive AMP kinase? It means it's just on. Not got, no longer doesn't care anything about what's going on with the rest of metabolism, all of those lysine residues and that histone are going to be faithfully acetylated. You're going to have business turned on. You're going to have those genes all expressed all the time. That's not a good thing because that mutation then would be, lead to what? If this happened in the hypothalamus, the orexigenic effect. Okay, let's back up here, sorry. So, nope, I don't want, I don't want this. Okay. Replacing serine with alanine abolishes acetylation. Placing serine with aspartate obviates, means it just goes around, amp kinase mediated phosphorylation to make acetylation constitutive and therefore rexogenic. It's hypothalamic. Epigenetic acetylation of histone lysine is known to enhance transcription via chromatin remodeling. We've already talked about that back at the beginning. Euchromatin, that means active chromatin, is uncompacted, transcriptionally active chromatin. And across the board, you're getting euchromatin. Okay, when you add those two activators of AMP kinase, right? Uh, and when you have the mutant, when you have the aspartate mutant, it doesn't have any increased effect from the, from the control. When you have the alanine 
uh, uh, substitution. There's no F activity, right? And this happens with euchromatin on every step of the way, right? Every step of the way. Wild type compared to all these distant transcription factors. And these are two different serine residues here. Serine 190, serine 314. You can see there's phosphorylation on serine 314. And there's also phosphorylation on serine 190. So it's not just serine 730. So there's getting there's a hierarchical cascade of phosphorylation on multiple serine signals in the AMP kinase. And all of that makes for euchromatin, and euchromatin means it's transcriptionally active, which means you're going to get, because of the genes that are turned on by these transcription factors, what? More mitochondria. Okay, mitochondrial DNA content across the board here, okay? Mitochondrial DNA content. Electron transport, okay, this is complex. One activity, complex five, that's ATP synthesis. And there's at ROS going down because of this, okay? Mitochondrial DNA content, electron transport, Oxfos proteins are increased via AMP kinase mediated phosphorylation across the board. And this is all because of turning down the methyltransferase and turning up the acetyltransferase. Okay. And you don't see it in the mutant. It's alanine. You don't do see it in the constitutive aspartate. Okay. Uh, so epigenetic chromatin remodeling and somatic activities where methylation is suppressed and acetylation, sorry about that, I just saw it, is enhanced by means of this AMP activity. Okay, acetylation of the chromatin, you get more mitochondrial DNA, which we know that's going to be because of TFAM, right? You get DNA replication of the mitochondria. You're also turning on, this is like the end product, down at the end of the road, is, this, you know, is, is when rubber hits the road, are you really making more competent functional mitochondria? Yes. How are you doing it? By the activation of AMP kinase. And how is that happening? By acetylation, okay, of specific canonical histones. Uh, lysines on those histones, and because of demethylation of those cytosine residues in those promoter regions of those key enzymes. Okay, that's the key here. And ROS accumulation is also is defeated. Sorry, um, and why is that? Because you're running the electron transport chain. You've you've made a competent mitochondria. Okay, so you're making it function right, even in the presence of metformin, right? Because you're not transferring those electrons just to molecular oxygen. It's not becoming the electron sink. So decreasing ROS. That's all good. So what's the summary here? AMP kinase controls metabolism via phosphorylation of transcription factors. AMP kinase activation requires a low energy charge. Phosphorylation of the transcription factors we just talked about, like PGC1-alpha, for example, which are responsible for the expression of genes regul regulating mitochondrial genesis and function work through complex mechanisms, and function work through complex mechanisms, one of which seems to be epigenetic control of a chromatin remodeling. Okay. So that's a mouthful, but that's basically what we're saying. AMP kinase is also working epigenetically to control the expression of the genes involved in mitochondrial genesis, which is what AMP kinase is supposed to do. It's supposed to start making more ATP. What do you make ATP in the mitochondria? How do you make more mitochondria? By turning on the transcription factors which make more mitochondria. Mitochondrial DNA replication, uh, and then gene expression of the mitochondrial genes, and uptick of the nuclear genes, which carry out the rest of the functions to make that mitochondria competent, functional, and potent. I'll just link back to obesity. Therapy on upregulating a hypothalamic AMP kinase could control appetite suppression. Okay? So again, AMP kinase is really important there, right? If you want to control appetite, what are you going to do? You're going to want to alter that AMP kinase activity, right? AMP kinase mutations could be associated with lack of appetite control. It's a good question. One that I thought of, I didn't look in the literature for that. Maybe it's already there. So good students will look and see if it is. Uh, I will certainly look it up. Obesity may result in the lack of stimulation of kinase mediated AMP kinase activation, thus increasing the potential for type 2 diabetes. So again, if you don't get that AMP kinase control, Right? If you're not getting that AMP kinase control because you're overriding it because of all the excess ATP, you're not going to become catabolic. You're not going to, for example, mobilize lipid from adipose tissue. You're not going to brown adipose tissue to make more mitochondria to burn more fatty acids via fatty acid oxidation. All of that then is going to mean you have high circulating glucose, high circulating free fatty acid, hypertriglyceridemia, hypercholesterolemia. <coughs> 
uh, and then the components of metabolic syndrome, like high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and even cancer can be associated with. All can funnel into an understanding of amkinase. That's not the only player. We're just being very myopic here. But I'm trying to show you how amkinase is a player, major one. That's why pharmacothera pharmacotherapeutics is looking at it, looking at it very carefully. Now, very cool here is that the two E's are involved. Epigenetics, I hope I showed you that with the methyltransferases and acetyltransferases. And endocrinology, all those adipokines and all those hormones, ghrelin, leptin, uh, all are working synergistically to control and modify adiposity. So this is not a simple thing. Right? So in those adolescents that are starting to gain weight because they're eating too much and sitting around at home too much maybe, drinking a lot of high sugar containing uh, drinks and also not getting the exercise they used to get, you're setting the stage for epigenetic reprogramming that can lead to a lowering of amp kinase regulation in the hypothalamus that is altering it so that you're constantly hungry, for example, by allowing it to produce more and more and more of those orexigenic adipokines, at the same time corrupting muscle and liver glucose and fatty acid homeostasis, thus dysregulating homeostasis and then incurring the cost of higher circulating glucose, higher circulating free fatty acids, hypertriglyceridemia, hypercholesterolemia, and all the components of obesity linking to type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, metabolic diseases, and also potentially neurological diseases like AD, PD, and prefrontal dementia, which are all linked to amkinase as well. So thank you for your undivided attention. Again, I'm Dan Guerra, and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer and Major Lecturer for VerevMed, of which I'm a co-founder. There's our email address. Please contact us with any comments or suggestions on these lectures. And also, uh, if you're interested in learning more about this topic or many of the other topics that we can discuss by examining the literature, looking at the evidence and verifying that evidence against the backdrop of what the literature canonically describes using, of course, ideation and concepts to come up with new ideas about what the literature is trying to tell us um, and that could be fed into biomedicine. So thanks a lot. Really appreciate your time. And time, again, is how we started this. And time now, finally, it's time for quitting time. Okay. Time is actually right for quitting time. So ciao.